this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the Travelers Championship with Colin Davey. He is a data scientist on Twitter, at ADJ Baseline, talking about his favorite bets for the Travelers Championship and his general process for betting on golf. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work at ThePowerRank.com. Um, Ed, they announced last night baseball is coming back. It will be opening day on July 23rd. We are less than a month away from the opening, unless things get weird <laughs> till then, which they could. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm a little bummed that this weekend is the last weekend of the Bundesliga, and uh, my numbers kind of look terrible compared to the markets because there's a lot of motivation. And yeah. in fact, you know, a lot of teams have stuff to play for, and some don't. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited to get some more American sports. Baseball is going to be added. Uh, you know they're going to be playing in their home stadiums that are going to be empty. So a little bit more of a data set for uh, yeah. home advantage without fans. And uh, that's exciting. And also a closer proxy for NFL because there will be some travel involved, um, or at least more travel potentially than, like, the Bundesliga because sure. they're going to be playing divisional teams, so it will be closer. But they will be, like... Going from Minis- like Minneapolis to Milwaukee is still five hours or whatever. Like that, that's like enough yeah. where it's an impactful travel number. Um, so it's going to be very interesting, and I want to see that data. But I'm also just excited to see some baseball because it's been upsetting. Like I, I'm not yeah. awake in time to catch the KBO. I like following the KBO <laughs> because I, I, it's fun to like look at some old. Uh, MLB players who didn't necessarily succeed in Major League Baseball having success right. over there, and um, the team names are fun and stuff like that, but it'll, it'll be nice to have Major League Baseball back, too. Yeah, I mean, I'm not such a data nerd that I'm only interested in the home home field without fans, but yeah, I think it's going to be nice to have some baseball back. You know, a little disappointed it's only a 60-game season, but obviously MLB had their issues in getting this going, uh, but it's nice to see that they, they figured it out, and uh, we're, they're going to get at least the 60 game season going. Yeah. And I think it's going to be awesome. Um, it's like, it'll be very interesting to see how things play out because there is going to be a lot of randomness, which sure. I kind of want the chaos. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm all on board uh, with that. It should be a lot of fun. So we'll be talking baseball. I'm sure before we get to the new opening day uh, later in July, but first we got to talk some golf. We're going to have Colin Davey on. You can find him on Twitter at ADJ baseline. We're going to discuss the Travelers Championship, his takeaways from the opening couple weeks of golf, uh, coming off of the COVID-19 layoff, and his favorite bets for this weekend. Make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, iHeartRadio. I could go on and on. If you name it, you can probably find us there. Uh, make sure you hit us up there. And if you like what Colin has to say, please leave us a rating and review as well. Before we bring Colin on, though, we got to go back to last week. We had Ted Knutson on to talk about the return of the EPL. And, Ed, you talked about it, too. And you and uh, Ed, Ted did pretty well with your numbers. So let's talk about that, and I'll talk about Talladega before we get to Colin. Covering the past. All right, so last week we had Ted Knudsen on. You can find him on Twitter at MixedNuts, K-N-U-T-S, and talked a little bit of EPL. And Ted liked Southampton uh, against Norwich. They were plus 120. Southampton rolled in that one. Uh, they won 3-0. Ed, I know that your numbers like them as well. So uh, riding high on Southampton there. Uh, Ted also mentioned Brighton at plus 240 against Arsenal. Plus 240 for a money line, pretty good. They won that game 2-1. to one. The final one uh, that Ted had mentioned was Sheffield United at plus 130 against Newcastle. Newcastle won that one, uh, but going 2-1 to one on picks that were all plus money, pretty solid showing by Ted there, and I know he was uh, asking for your numbers as well on those numbers too, Ed. Good confirmation that you were on the same page. You had a tough one uh, for Leicester City against Watford. You've had some bad luck in the final minutes of matches the past two weeks. Uh, Leicester <laughs> City took a 1-0 lead at, in the 90th minute. And that put you at plus 115 in a good spot. But then Watford scored three minutes into stoppage time to tie things back up, ended in a draw. So all around a good showing for the soccer numbers last week, but could have been even better if not for, again, last minute goals kind of biting you in the butt there. Yeah, well, and and the thing part of it was like, 
you know, my numbers didn't think Leicester was as good as being like third in the table as yeah. well. So it was a little bit surprising that, you know, that, yeah. that they found value against Watford. Um, so, uh, yeah, overall, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, and we may get back to Southampton later in the show. How are you feeling about your numbers after one week back in the EPL? Because it seemed like things went pretty well based on the way that you and Ted seemed to jive on a lot of those numbers. Yeah, I mean, another game I'll point out, you know, my numbers are not as high on Liverpool as the markets were. Um, They ended up tying 0-0 with Everton. Everton was the better team. They had more chances in the second half to win that match. Uh, They were up 1.4 to 0.9 in expected goals. So, um, yeah, I like that as well. You know, Liverpool's going to win the league. They're, they're I think, uh, as we record, I think they're about to play right now. Um, they're going to wrap up the league, and then motivation is going to be an interesting issue there. It's not necessarily how good they are. So we'll keep an eye on that as well. Absolutely. But a good opening weekend uh, for the EPL, for sure. Uh, for NASCAR last week, I discussed three longish shots that I like to win in Talladega. Those guys were Eric Almarola, Clint Boyer, and Matt Benedetto. Almarola and Boyer were 26 to 1. Di Benedetto was 40 to 1. Boyer and Di Benedetto wrecked together, so that's always good. Uh, Boyer was running sixth <laughs> with two laps left, uh, but then he wrecked, took Di Benedetto with him. They finished uh, 25th and 36th. Sweet. Uh, Almarola also spun in the last lap. So all three of them, we went three for three on spinning in the last lap. But Almarola still almost won the race, uh, potentially as a result of spinning. But so Ryan Blaney was leading, in case you didn't watch. He blocked Eric Jones and John Hunter Nemechek who were coming on the outside. And that slowed Blaney's down. The contact did. And that allowed Al Marola to get this run. He was coming on the inside of Blaney. They were like right in front of the start finish line. Al Marola had this gap and he had the momentum. And then Ricky freaking Stenhouse Jr. spun Al Marola right before the line. Al Marola, the back end of his car was half a car length behind Ryan Blaney when Ryan Blaney won the race. Uh, so Al Marola finished third behind Blaney and Stenhouse in like this super close finish. He almost won it while going backwards, which would have been awesome. Um, 26 to one finishing half a car length back. I'm not going to complain about that. I can complain because I think he would have won if Stenhouse hadn't done a very Ricky Stenhouse thing and, and wrecked Al Marola. But I'm going to take it. I think it was still a good process. Uh, but that was a wild Wild race and a lot of fun. I'd mentioned Nemechek, too, in the betting guide and number fire. He is 65 to 1. Wasn't competitive the entire race and then almost came on the outside and won it. But uh, it was fun to have a, a couple of drivers there in the sweat at the end, even if Almarola couldn't quite get the job done. But a win in reverse would have been pretty sweet. I would have taken that for sure. Oh, well. Maybe next time in Talladega. We'll see. For sure. All right, so we're going to bring on Colin Davey now. Once again, you can find him on Twitter at ADJ Baseline. He uh, has done work for SB Nation. He built the live win probability model for the Action Network. Uh, we used to work for Fantasy Labs and good golf data guy. And that's why we wanted to have Colin on for this week to preview the Travelers Championship. We know that things are about to start as we're recording this on Wednesday. So we are going to talk some in-tournament betting as well and overall process for Colin to get his thoughts. So let's bring on Colin now and pick his brain a bit about betting on golf. Covering the present. Let's bring in Colin Davey now to talk betting on golf. Colin, I hear that you have a superhuman immune system so i'm excited to have you on the show today how you doing i'm great despite ed's best efforts i am here (laughs) and talking with you all um sloan was an interesting visit to boston this year uh in retrospect but of everyone in that group i think i came out kind of the the best so count my blessings i guess i don't know if it's luck or skill so you, you managed to breathe the air of many, many people who ended up with COVID and, and that we know tested positive for COVID. And somehow you were you have been just fine. So, yeah, I, I feel like I need to be like promoting an elixir or a snake oil or something <laughs> and as, as well as this golf knowledge. So but I, I don't know. I don't have a good explanation for it. Okay, so no magical elixir yet. We will yes. check back on you, though, uh, because I think they're clearly the cases are back on the rise. There's still a market for this magical elixir, so you've still got a window to profit, and I think that um, we, we can revisit that for sure. Yes, stay tuned to this space. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so let's dive into some golf here, Colin. We've got two events under our belts since the end of the COVID-19 layoff. So we got some fresh data, and it's the first time we've had fresh data in three months. So that's good. 
The problem is it's eight rounds, and that's a pretty small sample. So how much value are you putting in what we've seen out of these golfers in these two events? And is it misleading? Like, what are you thinking about these past two events so far? So it's the it's kind of the classic question in golf in general. How much do you weight recent versus long term? And it's kind of compounded by like we don't really have a good long term or we have an adjusted picture of long term. So when I hear that question, how much do you, you know, weight the past two or three events in general? It's always a question of, you know, how do you weight it compared to what? Right. And from my time kind of building up the golf models at Fantasy Labs and my own research as well, um, you always have you start with kind of a base assumption of have some way to calculate someone's you know long term expectation or just kind of like their overall solid form. And recent form is always basically an adjustment from that. So we have two rounds. And, yeah, it's not a lot. And on top of which, it's such a drastic change in timeline. And there could have been all sorts of things that have happened. It could be new playing conditions. And so I default to kind of a longer term view of all these golfers. And so you kind of give it the same weight as you did as though the tour had, you know, been continuing this whole time. So it's some adjustment, but the bulk of your evaluation should still be how good all of these golfers were before we all went on hiatus. Excellent, Colin. Um, Tell us a little bit about your approach to that, uh, the data that you use, because I think it's a little bit different from what other people use sometimes to evaluate golfers. Yes, it is. Um, And Ed, I don't know if that's an indirect plug for your own models, but for those (laughs) not in the know, Ed and I actually have the exact same base algorithm that we use to uh, rank a lot of our players and teams. Only difference is I did it for golf and Ed does it for basically everything during not golf. And we may be biased, but I think it's actually a really really good algorithm uh, to handle definitely jumps in time. And if your data is cut off, it's really good at kind of picking up right where we left back off. So the, um, the data itself is nothing too fancy. It's just basically a record of everyone's, uh, all golfers, um, kind of strokes per round. The difference is it adjusts for a lot under the hood and it kind of figures out, um, almost like a more advanced version of strokes gain. If this golfer beat this golfer, in this tournament by seven strokes, but lost to him by three strokes and other golfers did that. And it kind of collides them all together to produce kind of a steady state rank order of who is overall best. It's kind of similar to strokes gained, except it takes into account strength of schedule or quality of field uh, in a lot more sophisticated way that I think produces a lot more kind of stable uh, rankings of players. Um, I like it a little bit better than uh, strokes gained for a lot of reasons. One, strokes gained has a lot of gaps in the data, uh, especially in tours like web or events like web.com and European tour where they don't have shot link data and you have holes in the data. Uh, and the adjustments that you're able to make from, you know, strength of schedule and quality of competition are a lot more predictive than any kind of granular adjustments you might get from things like strokes gain tee to green, strokes gain putting, stroke, stroke gain top of tee. They don't really have a good strength of field adjustment to them. So keeping on that same subject, do you think that that better positions you to have a good read on golfers who may have like excelled during the swing season, like looking at these younger golfers, like Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland, uh, these golfers who did really well, maybe when the fields weren't as strong, do you feel more confident in your evaluation of those golfers, given that that's the way you are judging them is, is relative to field strength? Absolutely. I think you get a lot of cases where people will rattle off top five, top tens, top twenties as a predictive stat. And it's a good shorthand, but um, it, it's kind of an incomplete stat. Um, why not include European tours as well, as well as that? I mean, that's the, one of the biggest challenges is with these European golfers when they move to and from the different tours. How do you evaluate, you know, a 47th at the Sony in Hawaii versus a fifth at something like the, the South African Tishwani Open? Like, it's not the same caliber of field. You need a way to kind of have a Rosetta Stone and translate between the two. Um, and I think that approach kind of 
once you can adjust for those quality of fields, you get a much better overall picture for those golfers. Interesting. I think that's definitely necessary, especially for majors when we have a lot of that movement, guys coming over from the European tour and stuff like that. So definitely, I think, a a smart way to approach that. Let's go back here to talking about the end of the COVID-19 layoff. We mentioned that we're mostly buying in to longer term form. Have there been any specific golfers who have stood out to you as being wildly different from where they were before the COVID-19 layoff, whether it be for a good or bad reason? This may there may be no one. uh, But is there anyone who stood out to you? Well, I don't think this discussion is complete without mentioning, mentioning Bryson DeChambeau and the yeah. roughly 95 pounds he has put on <laughs> during the layoff. Um, I'm actually the first to admit that uh, when looking at numbers alone, data will not capture drastic changes that people have undergone like in those layoffs. Um, I think my default assumption is whatever the golfers were before the layoff, they were after the layoff. And you're going to find exceptions to that that are backed up by qualitative and quantitative data. Because golf is such a small sample size sport to begin with, I think you start from a stronger position, assuming that any drastic changes are probably small sample and not statistically significant. If you want to make any kind of you know actionable decisions off of changes that you do see, it's probably best backed up by qualitative backing. Either you know that they've made changes, uh, you know that there's something physically different with them. I'm the first to admit, though, that that is outside of the realm of data alone. Yeah, well, 95 pounds does seem like an adjustment. <laughs> I, it's not 95. It's something. He's he's a Mack truck now. W- whatever your He's Mike Trout. Is. He's Mike Trout yes. with a golf club. Yes, exactly. Well, that could be good, I guess, I think. <laughs> um Colin, let's talk a little bit about golfers and their matches with courses. Uh, how do you fit a golfer with the course, and d- does that change your model and where they're expected to play? So there are a lot of different approaches to finding course fit. Uh, as, as a concept, I do believe that different golfers and different types of golfers do better or worse in certain types of courses. And so my approach at a high level is um, – kind of come up with a model for based off of golfers generic stats how well you'd expect them to do overall if someone's shooting you know an average of 69 strokes per round and you don't know what their strengths are all else being equal you expect them to do better than someone who's true 71 without knowing what their strengths and weaknesses are so once you have kind of some base expectation of how golfers will do in general based off of their high level stats what you can do is figure out on a course by course basis, what type of golfers, uh, given their descriptive stats, things like driving distance, accuracy, uh, scrambling ability, putting ability, uh, what golfers have overachieved or underachieved those base expectations on a course by course basis. Uh, You can do that with uh, any kind of method you want. I like something as a simple regression model to show which stats show over and under performance on each course uh, course by course basis. And you can kind of get at least a directional idea of what types of golfers will do better or worse in each particular course. So when you go through that process for TPC River Highlands, which is where the Travelers Championship is this weekend, does it lead you to a certain archetype uh, that you expect to do better than usual at a course like that? Yeah, River Highlands actually has a pretty clear archetype in my mind. Um, One of the weaker fits is uh, I think it promotes accuracy over distance. It's not a bomber's course. You have things like driving accuracy and greens and regulation uh, having a slight boost to certain types of golfers. But I think the more interesting fit uh, is bad putters do better at River Highlands. Interesting. Okay. And that's a weird one to wrap your mind around. But if you walk through it a little bit, it does kind of make sense. I do believe in the abstract that uh, let's take uh, a, uh, a golf course where putting is literally has randomness everywhere. Let's say there are landmines and they blow up every seventh ball or something like that. Um, if your bread and butter is making, is doing, you know, making long putts and putting well, if there's just randomness spewed across all of those putting surfaces, your advantage is neutralized. And so the way that that's reflected in data is if you're a good putter and your advantage is neutralized, then bad putters do better than they would otherwise. 
So conceptually, it's not that hard to imagine. As, for, as far as something more practical, maybe the greens are so fast that they're all putting on glaciers. And so the ability to read greens and kind of make those minute adjustments is neutralized by the fact that it's just such a fast course that it's tough to capitalize on that edge. So uh, bad putters far and away have, I think, the biggest advantage to their opponents uh, at this course than they would any other course. As someone who has talked myself into losing a lot of money in daily fantasy on guys like Joel Damon and other bad putters, that is just music to my ears. It makes me very happy to hear that. This is a green light weekend for you, Jim. <laughs> we're feeling good. That is for sure. So, Colin, we're talking to you here Wednesday afternoon. So there's not a ton of time before the tournament, but I do want to talk about the full tournament here first before we look at live golf or live betting with golfing. Uh, any golfer stand out to you as being undervalued based on the current odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, and a lot of it uh, is based on what these golfers were doing before that. You know, all, all this layoff hit. Uh, all these layoffs hit, and a lot of them are not necessarily household names yet. Um, if you want some spicier takes, uh, I believe that Colin Morikawa and Xander Shoffley are top five golfers in the world right now. Um, there, uh, I tend to like younger players who that just uh, if people show really good form at a younger age, before they're basically 26, you can count on them having a lot of like growth and upside baked into their process because players do generally improve like from 22 to 26 and you kind of can, you can anticipate that they will get better with a little bit more seasoning. Um, I think the results they've shown to date um, put them right up there with Rory, right there with Justin Thomas, like right, th right up there with Bryson. And it's easy to forget that they're putting up really good results before all the stuff hit. Um, on, if, for a couple more names that kind of fit the profile similarly, Victor Hovland, who did win the Puerto Rico, which is, you know, based admittedly kind of a JV tournament that used to be web.com. Um, but he did it in enough convincing fashion and beat some pretty good names that he's showing enough upside, uh, as well as one name that has not got a lot of buzz yet, Scotty Scheffler. I think he's just as much of uh, some of these young guns that kind of show the same upside. And he's young enough that I think you can bake in some improvement where he is due for a good showing any one of these days. And I think that the that it's interesting to hear you name those, specifically the three younger guys outside of Xander, because what do they all struggle with? It's a short game for a lot of those guys. So I think it's it's interesting that you are gravitating in that direction. Uh, Scheffler, 75 to 1. While you were talking, Morikawa moved from 40 to 39. So someone may be in on this stream and is listening to you give out these picks. So just be aware of that uh, as we're going through here. But I think it is interesting to hear the guys who struggle with the short game being the ones you're focusing on here, because it, it lines up with what you were saying before. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, this is a green light for bad putters. And if that's one of the weaknesses, I think it'll be uh, severely diminished this weekend. Excellent. Um, what are your thoughts about in-tournament betting? Is that something that you do? Uh, how, what are the differences between in-tournament betting and pre-tournament betting? I mean, like any in-game betting, it's a live adjustment of your priors going into the tournament versus what has happened in the tournament. And if there's ever a place to introduce even more randomness and adjustment uh, in golf, it is in tournament versus uh, pre-tournament. So I don't think that I necessarily have the expertise to touch that, uh, um, especially considering staggered tee times, weather effects. There's just a lot to process on the fly. And I think there is you know, value to be found in in-tournament betting. Um, I don't think that the live data necessarily supports it from a pure data angle, but there are definitely people who know how to, you know, make qualitative decisions on the fly, adjusting from that kind of priors um, and kind of capitalize accordingly. I just don't think that, you know, data uh, or pure data is, uh, you know, a good enough approach to do that profitably. So what are the resources you lean on then uh, when you're trying to make those assumptions? Are there certain places you will go to, to try to get uh, any qualitative data you can get at least? Or are you trying to watch the tournament yourself to get that, uh, that, that qualitative aspect of it? Or how are you uh, going about it? What resources do you lean on most? Um, for that qualitative stuff, it's mostly people who are closer to the game, whether people who either watch a lot of it, people who know some of those players on tour, uh, or have some kind of experience. It's, a, I think, a good way to test hypotheses of your own. 
Um, you know, always a pro not, don't necessarily go in with the narratives that you're looking to prove already. You should have some inkling of, you know, I think this is an angle. I think this is something to look at. Uh, and, you know, that should be either confirmed or denied or should at least align with someone who has seen something similar um, from a completely different angle. So you're leaning more on people rather than numbers when it comes to live betting. Is that a correct uh, take away from that? Or did I just yeah, I th oh, I mean, I think your numbers always found your first foundation. Sure. And then like any adjustments from that, you know, should be validated by, you know, people basically. Okay, perfect. That is Colin Davey. Uh, Colin, I want to uh, thank you for swinging by, chatting some golf with us, and hopefully at some point spreading your magical elixir for avoiding uh, terrible diseases. Appreciate it. Uh, good luck with this weekend. Hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you very much. Covering the future. One final thank you to Colin Davey for swinging by and breaking down the Travelers Championship in Ed. Uh, it was cool to hear him talk about how he uses a similar approach to his models as you do for yours. It's always fun when, when things align like that. I know. I probably should, should have killed the kid a couple of years ago, so he stopped <laughs> applying all my stationary distribution of Markov chain methods to uh, <laughs> to other sports. But, uh, no, it's definitely a good thing. He forgot to mention he applied it first to tennis, I think, before he ever okay. got into the golf. So he's got some tennis numbers. Um, I think he's still running those. Yeah, and but, I think the baseline in his Twitter account refers yes. to tennis, too. So maybe yeah. we'll have to get him on for uh, some tennis. We can have, like, a, a whale capper, uh, a whale capper, Colin Davey crossover type episode, something yeah. like that. If tennis ever comes back, if Novak Djokovic stops doing weird things, like, we can eventually get back <laughs> to that. So, uh... I mean, that it is really funny that the two sports most amenable to social distancing, like right. golf and tennis, are, like, so slow in coming back. Yeah. I mean, like, golf's had this weird uptick. There was a time on Wednesday where it kind of looked like they were going to cancel the Travelers. Um, apparently, that's not happening, which is a good thing. But regardless, it was uh, it was a weird time. So, I don't know. It's, it's grim uh, for the prospects of stuff in the fall. It's a little bit scary as things come back with all the, this increase in, in cases. So, you know... Yeah. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, before we dive into covering the future, FanDuel Sportsbook is giving you a chance to get in on the action risk-free. Create a FanDuel Sportsbook account today and place your first bet. If you lose, you will receive a refund of up to $500 in site credit. It is that easy. For more details, visit sportsbook.fanduel.com. Offer valid for new users only. Must be 21 years old. Gambling problem? Call one 800 gambler let's take a look at covering the future ed you want to talk some more epl for this week what are your numbers saying about uh this week's set of matches yeah i think the idea here is that you're looking for teams that are much better in expected goals than they are in the table so what i do is i take the data fb rough uh, which is my new favorite website in the entire world and I take the expected goals in each game, I adjust for strength of schedule, and then I'm able to rank teams. And then the rankings on offense and defense also give me a set of win probabilities, which you can go check out at thepowerrank.com slash predictions. And Ted Newton talked last week about Southampton. Uh, the numbers definitely supported that. Uh, digging a little bit deeper, they are 14th in the table, so not particularly good. Uh, but they're actually as high as 7th when you look at expected goals adjusted for schedule. And, you know, normally uh, I would never just say, hey, you know, it looks like there's value on Southampton just because my numbers say that. Um, but I'm definitely going to lean on what Ted said last week. Uh, you know, someone who, who watches a lot of games and knows the sport a lot better than I do. Um, uh, like we mentioned, they did deliver last week. Uh, Midweek, uh, they do have a match against Arsenal. Uh, my, my predictions are up. Uh, it says Southampton has a 42.5% chance to win which suggests some value at plus 155. And then, um, so so just a team to follow as well. They have a match against Watford this weekend. Uh, I have not posted the predictions yet on my site, but it certainly does look like uh, they will suggest some value on Southampton. So uh, all the Premier League predictions will be up at thepowerrank.com slash predictions. Does it feel good to have like fresh data going up on the site once again? 
Yeah, it's it, it's almost really weird to yeah. to not be updating things and um you know right now like you know with all my football stuff like I've been doing it for so long that I just I I type update into my computer and it just right. gets everything going and I haven't had a chance to automate everything so much with the soccer stuff but yeah. it's still nice to look at things and um and uh yeah just taking in new information for a sport I really do like and that feels pretty good. All right, I like that. So Southampton, once again, high in Ed's numbers. Uh, for this weekend in NASCAR, there are actually two NASCAR Cup Series races at Pocono, and the odds are up at FanDuel Sportsbook for the first one. And I have two bets that I like a lot based on those numbers. The first one is Ryan Blaney. He is now 13-1 to to win at FanDuel Sportsbook, and he did just win on Monday in Talladega. And Talladega and Pocono, super different tracks. So it doesn't matter that Ryan Blaney won there. But... He's been running well everywhere else recently, too, so I want to buy into him at 13-1. to 1. Blaney, six top five finishes in the past seven races. In the lone race where he didn't get a top five, he led 60 laps and then wrecked while running second. So good in all each of the past seven races with at least some shot to win. And the top fives have come at one-and-a-half-mile tracks, a short track, a super speedway. So the track type does not matter. He is just running crazy well right now. And... He is a past winner in Pocono. He won here in 2017, back when he was still with Wood Brothers Racing. His best finish since then is sixth, but he is in the middle of a career year, his age 26 season, which is a very productive season for, you know, kind of like what Colin was talking about, where you want to find guys who are productive and ahead of their aging curves. Ryan Blaney is that, and the form is really good here. Right now, Ryan Blaney is second in my model behind Kevin Harvick. Harvick is plus 550, while Blaney is 13 to 1, so... I think Blaney is a tremendous bet. I also have a future bet on him, which we had talked about on covering the future. He was 28 to 1 to win the championship. He's now down to 10 to 1, so feeling good about the, the championship bet on Blaney as well. For a longer shot of Pocono, I love Tyler Reddick at 65 to 1. Reddick is a rookie, so this will be his first Cup Series race in Pocono, but he did finish second here in the Xfinity Series last year, and. The car he is currently in ran well on this track last year. That was Daniel Hemrick, who was running the eight car last year. And Hemrick finished seventh in the second race here last year. He was 13th in the first race. Two of his better finishes for the entire year. And Reddick has taken that car to a new level this year. So we could expect him to potentially push for a top five type run this week. He had a fourth place average running position uh, in Homestead two weeks ago. That is like the prototypical Tyler Reddick track and Pocono is not that, but it shows that he and his equipment do have upside. I think that that's at least intriguing when his odds are 65 to 1. So Reddick, a longer shot at 65 to 1, I do like that quite a bit, but I think that Blaney is my preferred bet between the two. 13 to 1, he actually opened at 11, so maybe you can potentially like hold off on Blaney even and maybe get him at a better number, but I think even at a, if he were to go back to 11 to 1, he'd still be an advantageous bet in my mind. Ed, I'm kind of sad that uh, the, the run of NASCAR is coming to an end because we're going to have other sports to bet. And, like, I've had a lot of fun having a legitimate excuse to just keep talking NASCAR on here. So it makes me kind of sad that we'll have other stuff that I can uh, shoehorn into covering the future. Well, it doesn't mean you got to stop. So, this I is mean, true. We'll, we'll get into baseball a little bit, which will be excellent. Uh, but... You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I might be talking about soccer for a while. We'll see. Hey, I mean, I mean we yeah. have Champions League coming back in uh, in early August. They're going to finish that up. And then I don't know when they're planning on starting the fall leagues. But yeah, I think wasn't the MLS planning on being in Orlando, too, like along with the NBA? I, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember either. But well, that might be <laughs> doing yeah. this as well. But uh, yeah. regardless, it's been fun to have uh, some NASCAR talk here on Covering the Spread. Maybe we'll get to keep doing that going forward. That is all that we have for today, though. Uh, Ed, anything you want to plug over at the Football Analytics Show or over at the Power Rank? Yeah, the Power Rank. Please sign up for my free email newsletter. Uh, when we do start getting closer to the NFL seasons, I'll start posting some of my best predictions uh, up there. So definitely don't miss out on that. And then uh, I also wanted – I did an episode – uh, about what the probability of football and uh so someone tweeted at me about it last week and was like you know your guest mentioned that the numbers in the u.s are going down what was he talking about i was like oh that's interesting so i went to the johns hopkins site and and looked at their data 
And uh, sadly, we had we had recorded that on June 10th, which yeah. was the bottom of uh, basically the minimum of the daily new cases in the United States. Yeah, it has sadly gone up since then. And um, yeah, it's a worrisome trend. Uh, there's a there, there's a lot of things to worry about for the American sports fan. The the situation in Florida is really bad, and that's exactly where the NBA wanted to finish their season. You know, Dr. Anthony Fauci said that the NFL should do what the NBA is doing and play, you know, quarantine the entire league in one location. He doesn't have the power to actually make that happen. And right. I don't think the NFL is going to listen to him at all. I think they're going to they're going to try their best oh, to play. And I, and I think they're going to be able to do it. But anyways, there's just a lot of cautionary tales out there, you know, continuing number of cases in, in the college football ranks. Um, so. Not the best time, you know. Nope. I, I feel like we've gone through like ups and lo- ups and downs with this. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like every day when I look at the new numbers, it's been cons- it was concerning when the numbers had plateaued and were no longer going down, and then it was like, uh oh, little slight tick up, right. and then it's like, uh oh, and then it's like, uh oh, like just yeah. increasing magnitudes of frightening uh, as right. the case numbers have gone back up because. It kind of seems like there's no, you know, putting the toothpaste back in the tube because people probably aren't going to like lock down again like they did the first time. And the cases are almost as bad as they were back then. Yeah. I mean, I think the states have talked about that's the last resort to lock down again. Yeah. Um, But obviously, no one wants to do that, which is why, you know, Michigan's has been great. You know, I think the governor has done a really good job following the science and and waiting for all the metrics before opening up the state. And that was definitely frustrating for a while yeah. because you know we couldn't get back out but now finally we're getting to the point where we can but you know we get about yeah, 100 200 cases a day new cases a day in michigan that's been i, I think one of the, the best states in america but to kind of put it in perspective that's about the same number that new cases that germany gets every day and they have about eight times the population of, yeah. of michigan so they're really doing things right over there uh in europe and uh i just you know, I, I hope the U.S. kind of goes in that direction and and, yeah. and so we can get our sports back this fall. I know a lot of you listening are very smart, so I trust that you are wearing masks. Uh, but if you're not, please do. They help a lot. Uh, I trust I trust all of you, our loyal listeners, to wear masks. So hopefully you are uh, because that does help out a lot. And that's why, like, in New York, it's the same thing. We've had been able to open up some things back up because cases have been down because people are wearing masks. So for those of you who have done so, thank you, and please keep on doing it. That is all that we have for this week. Make sure you check out Ed's work, thepowerrank.com. Check him out on Twitter, at thepowerrank as well. I am at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you once again to our guest, Colin Davey. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, at ADJ Baseline, to check out all of his work there. Thank you to Colin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And, of course, thank you to those of you who tuned in for today to check out Covering the Spread. We appreciate all you. Hope you you are staying safe. And good luck with your bets, whether it be PGA, UFC, NASCAR, EPL, Bundesliga, whatever it may be. Sports slowly trickling back, and hopefully uh, they can be profitable for you. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. (laughs) 